can access it, but it will deal with all the same themes that he's about to talk about tonight. So without further ado, uh, Randy Cunningham. Um, just wanted to start with an introduction about myself and all. Um, I've been an activist on the left since my college days at the end of the 1960s. I have always loved writing, though I've never done it professionally. And I also come from a Gabby family of storytellers. <laughs> so I found that writing about activism brought all these aspects of my life together. My research is based on oral interviews, or as I put it, uh, my research involves swapping war stories with other activists. Life is good. Uh, I spent most of my life, working life in the housing field. I worked with the neighborhood group, with neighborhood groups, the Cleveland Housing Court, and I wrapped up my career at the Cleveland Tenants Organization. It was working with the neighborhood groups that inspired me to write my book, Democratizing Cleveland, uh, The Rise and Fall of Community Organizing in Cleveland, Ohio, 1975 to 1985. I came to Cleveland in, the in 1980 and began to work for a neighborhood-based housing nonprofit called the Near West Housing Corporation. It was a spin-off of Near West Neighbors in Action, I've got the button on here, <laughs> which was part of a constellation of grassroots neighborhood-based groups that had been launched by the Commission for Catholic Community Action, or just the Commission as we termed it. The network of groups was affiliated with National People's Action and followed the organizing philosophy of Saul Alinsky, who has been called the Freud of community organizing. He developed his philosophy of social action while working with the packing house workers of the CIO and the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Organization in the 1930s and 40s. He had a long history of working with the Catholic Church in Chicago during his various campaigns. The community organizing movement in Cleveland would not have gotten off the ground without the support of the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland. The diocese was represented by the Catholic Commission, as represented by the Catholic Commission, was the sponsor, funder, and protector of the community organizations of this era. And the era I'm talking about is basically 75 to 85. Uh, the commission was the result of almost a decade of activism within the Catholic laity and clergy, who were inspired by Pope John XXIII's Vatican II which was in session from 62 to 65 and focused on the social issues of the day. When I started researching this book, I noticed one of the most interesting things I noticed is how each generation of activism rested on the legacies of previous generations of activism. That is certainly true for community organizing in general and progressive Catholic activism in Cleveland. Uh, for instance, the neighborhood I first worked in on the near west side was the host neighborhood of what was called the Education Research and Action Project of the Radical Students for a Democratic Society. We used to talk about the old SDS house on J Avenue. The current upscale residents would be surprised to learn that where they are living was an epicenter of radicalism in the mid-1960s. This summer project hoped to start an interracial movement of the poor, as it was called. It discovered local leaders such as Lillian Craig, who was instrumental in welfare rights organizing, which was very strong, a very strong movement in Cleveland. In fact, they had a famous um, march from Cleveland to Columbus <laughs> to rally for increased welfare benefits in 1966. And that uh, march began in Cleveland. Uh, veterans experienced and are inspired by this project helped lead generations of advocacy and organizing in Cleveland. There were two past traditions of Catholic activism in Cleveland. One was the Catholic Workers Movement led by Dorothy Day 
that had a major presence in Cleveland in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, they, they still have a Catholic worker organization right now. Then in the 1960s, a network of liberal Catholic suburbanites moved into the near west side and formed the Thomas Merton community with a mission of activism and service to what was then one of the poorest communities in Cleveland. Um, and uh, it was, I thought it was uh, interesting and some of the uh, Catholic activists that I know were in a state of rapture when uh, Pope Francis mentioned Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton. <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that, does it, Jim? Yeah. <laughs> Concerned with several issues. The first was the toxic racial atmosphere of segregated Cleveland. The other focuses were on poverty and the war in Vietnam. They were demanding that the church start addressing these issues. They were confronted by a Catholic church that was not interested in addressing these issues. In frustration, progressive Catholics in the Cleveland area launched the Committee for a Council in 1966. The aim of Committee for a Council was to call for a council to be held in, Cleveland, in the Cleveland Diocese to discuss how the initiatives of Vatican II would be implemented. It wanted the Cleveland Diocese to have its own version of Vatican II. The committee gathered over 10,000 signatures from local parishioners in a petition urging the Bishop, Bishop Isseman, to hold a council. Uh, Bishop Isseman was not amused. Uh, according to Reverend Bob again, the bishop called a mandatory meeting of all the priests in the diocese. He came out on the stage of the auditorium, threw the petition on the floor, and said that if anyone wanted to talk to him, especially the priests, they could knock on his door. The church was in a bind. This was the era of the Huff riots in 1966 and the Glenville shootout in 1969. The ethnic and white neighborhoods and parishes of Cleveland were resisting any of the demands for the, of this local civil rights movement. Priests who bucked this sentiment faced the wrath of their congregations and in some cases were fit, actually physically assaulted. In one such neighborhood, the Hungarian neighborhood of the Buckeye Woodland, armed white vigilante organizations were formed. In any diocese, it is the bishop that sets the agenda. Bishop Isseman was the last of the pre-Vatican Council, pre-Vatican II Council bishops in Cleveland. He was a conservative, but even a conservative has to recognize a problem. And the church had to recognize the problem of racial tensions in Cleveland and its impact on the church's parishes. In 1969, Isseman approved the formation of the Commission on Catholic Community Action. The commission was to take on the social and racial problems that the church did not want to touch. It was the first real victory for the progressives of the Committee for Council. What causes movements to take off and change the larger society is a mysterious thing that confounds both activists and establishment alike. History is a trickster, full of surprises that make fools out of those who think they know what is going on. But one thing you can do, you do find, is that movements are launched and take off when there is a constellation of forces and personalities that come together in the right place at the right time. Cleveland during the late 60s and decades of the 70s was such a place at such a time. Isseman retired from his position in 1974 and was replaced by Bishop James Hickey. It was under Bishop James Hickey that the commission took off and began asserting itself as a sponsor for organizing. The commission for Isseman was a concession. The commission for Hickey was his pride and joy. What gave the commission its vitality was the synergy of an of a brilliant and dedicated staff. They were reflective of the spirit of Agent II of the whole, and of the whole swirling torrent 
of social change that had turned American society upside down. Overseeing the commission was Auxiliary Bishop William Cosgrove. Under him were Reverend Dan Reedy and Harry Fagan. Under the tutelage of Bishop Hickey, these people, these three people, were the shapers of the commission. Auxiliary Bishop William Cosgrove combined attentiveness to the formal duties and traditions of the church with the idealism inherent in the commission. He was well liked by his fellow priests and the church hierarchy. He was athletic, always good with a joke, and was one of the boys. He was popular even with priests who were not interested in social justice. In short, he had a personality that helped the commission function within the confines of the diocesan hierarchy. Reverend Dan Reedy was the intellectual of the commission. He was brilliant, abrasive, and one person who knew him called him anti-clerical. He was one of the founders of the commission, but left it and the priesthood early on, eventually marrying and becoming an attorney in San Francisco. His great contribution was what he called crossover community organizing, which meant community organizing designed to unite diverse communities that became the guiding philosophy for the groups. Harry Fagan was the executive director of the commission. Fagan was a former advertising executive for the Plain Dealer who wanted more from life than selling ads. He wanted to make a mark in the larger world. To describe his personality, one of his friends said that you had to realize that he was raised behind a bar because his par parents were barkeepers. He held after work bull sessions at Fagan's Bar in the Flats that his parents had started and was a bohemian who frequented jazz clubs. He was a consummate schmoozer with foundation funders and this made him something of a financial sugar daddy to the groups. Some critics blamed him for making funding too easy for the groups which set them up for eventual financial failure. If there was one larger-than-life personality that dominated the commission, it was Harry. It was the additional good fortune of the commission to have a plentiful source of future organizers who were coming off college campuses after a generation of student activism. One common denominator in the resumes of these activists was a stint volunteering and working for the United Farm Workers. Tom Gannon was one of these leading organizers in Cleveland and the first director of the Buckeye Woodland Community Congress. He had not only been an organizer for the United Farm Workers in California, he had also been Cesar Chavez's bodyguard. The alignment of the stars continued in the presence of a cadre of young urban professionals who had been recruited to come to Cleveland during the reform administrations of Mayor Carl Stokes and Mayor Dennis Kucinich. This was especially true with the Cleveland Planning Commission led by Norm Krumholtz and staffed by people such as Janice Kiger and the present head of the Office of Homeless Services, Ruth Gillette. There were also people such as Hank Dahl who came to Cleveland with the Carl Stokes administration and then took a position with the George Gunn Foundation. After their tenure with the city was over, this population stayed in town and secured jobs with local foundations, universities, and nonprofits. They served as a brain trust for the community organizations and their organizers. The Buckeye Woodland Community Congress was the first and most influential community organization of this generation. It set the template for the movement. Former organizers for Buckeye became trainers for the commission, or when they left Buckeye, became directors of other organizations or directors of organizing. The movement began with Buckeye in 1974 and ended when Buckeye finally closed its doors in 1985. Buckeye came out of the experimental organizing that Dan Reedy championed. It received funding from local foundations such as the Gunn and Cleveland Foundation and the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, which funded most of the other groups. 
The funders were convinced by Reedy's experience that organizing was the way to keep the peace in Cleveland's neighborhoods and to avoid future ruinous rioting like it saw in the previous decade in Huff and Glenville. Buckeye relied on na National People's Action from Chicago for training and networking with similar community organizations across the country. NPA's founder was Gail Sincata, who won fame in Chicago fighting bank redlining in, the South in her South Chicago neighborhood. The organizing guru, guru of NPA was Shell Trap. Buckeye worked in one of the toughest environments imaginable. The Buckeye Woodland neighborhood was a racial battlefield of conflict between African Americans who were moving into the neighborhood and Hungarian and Italian residents who were resisting the integration of their neighborhood. This added to, an all, to all the usual problems neighborhoods in Cleveland were facing, such as declining public services, schools, inadequate law enforcement, and rising cram rates, bank and insurance redlining, and the decline of the housing stock. Buckeye took on the issue of bank redlining by focusing on the most powerful and prominent bank in Cleveland, Cleveland Trust. Research showed that Cleveland Trust branches in the neighborhood took in many deposits from the neighborhood but made very few loans. Buckeye had a tool that other groups had never had in the past with the Community Reinvestment Act which was passed in 1977. RA was known as it was known mandated that banks had to service the communities they were located in. They also confronted one of their most belligerent enemies was M. Brock Weir, CEO of Cleveland Trust, who recognized no one else's say over how his bank was run and was unabashedly racist. One veteran of Buckeye said that if you had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe against Weir, you could deal with anyone. <clears throat> Weir was not the only tough customer. Buckeye could be formidable at the same time. It took to heart a maxim of shell trap and NPA. If you aren't ready to fight, you aren't ready to win. As described by one of the veteran organizers, Buckeye did not take no for an answer. It would invite a corporate official or city hall official to a meeting. If they refused to meet, they would bring an uninvited delegation down to their offices. If they did agree to meet and then stood Buckeye up, the official would find a noisy demonstration in front of their house. As another veteran said, Buckeye was focused, knew what they wanted, and would not be deterred until the object of their grievances agreed to sit down and seriously negotiate. In the case of Cleveland Trust, which would become Ameritrust in 1979, there was a series of Community Reinvestment Act challenges that harassed the bank any time it wanted to merge with another bank, or a subsidiary, or close a branch. Weir, who made any conflict into a test of will, and one of his classic conflicts was against Dennis Kucinich. That was a complete and utter war that went on between Kucinich and Weir. I would say uh, what Norm Kronholtz called Weir, but this is a church, or church university and I won't say it. <laughs> Weir, who made any conflict into a test of wills, retired in 1983 and left town and was missed by no one, including no one at Ameritrust. He was replaced by cooler heads that formed the Ameritrust Development Bank, which leveraged financing for the neighborhoods and ended the era of warfare between the bank and the groups. Buckeye's in-your-face style of organizing was adopted by and adapted to local conditions by community organizations around the city. At its zenith, the community organizing movement in Cleveland was made up of, of anywhere from six to eight organizations. Each of the organizations would have a staff of four to six full-time organizers, servicing anywhere from 20 to 30 block clubs. Conventions routinely drew hundreds of participants. The initial meeting of Buckeye was attended by around 800 residents along with representatives from the city, the commission, and allied groups. Before this movement took shape, Cleveland City Hall and the corporate elite operated with impunity. M. Brock Weir's attitude was common. 
The neighborhoods were totally ignored and the city was headed for rack and ruin. This was the era of the mistake on the lake and Cleveland jokes being a standard fare of late night comedy shows. The initial reaction to the organizing by Cleveland's establishment was shock and awe. The shock and awe was frequently in response to what the groups called hits, or in contemporary organizing lingo, direct action. <clears throat> in one case, Citizens Bring Broadway Back was so frustrated trying to get a vacant arson structure torn down that they began to tear it down themselves. Soon realizing what a chore this was, they took debris from the house and delivered it to the offices of Cleveland De Cleveland's Department of Community Development. This led to a confrontation with the commissioner and them being thrown out of the offices. However, the house was demolished that evening. <laughs> Theatrical productions were common. In one case, St. Clair's Superior Coalition created an Easter float featuring a large Easter bunny and hundreds of Easter eggs each one representing a vacant and vandalized house in the neighborhood that the city ignored. Then they drove the float down to the community development offices for a rally. The groups routinely occupied the lobbies of banks and utility companies. They used humor. When Mayor Kucinich ignored an invitation to a meeting about a new fire station in Broadway, since it was around Halloween, citizens bring Broadway back substituted a pumpkin at his place at the table and interviewed it. <laughs> Another time, members of Near West Neighbors in Action went to a meeting with city officials wearing paper bands with cut-out pistols pointed at their heads to say that the city, Gloria remembers this, <laughs> to say that the city was holding a gun at their heads over a community development program. They won their demands. City officials who were invited to meetings on an issue of concern who then said they could not give the group an answer or just gave canned responses were thrown out of meetings for the per offense of wasting the group's time. Again, the groups demanded to be taken seriously. <clears throat> Each group found a particular issue that made its name and gave it street creds. Near West Neighbors in Action established its reputation with its fight against arson, which was terrifyingly rampant in the neighborhood. It was joined in this issue by Citizens Bring Broadway Back. Buckeye Woodland Community Congress and Union Miles Community Coalition were prominent in fighting bank and insurance redlining. All the groups were focused on the issues, on issues of housing, problems, city services, and crime. How the community development block grant funds were allocated was a major issue because city council at this time used them as a big political slush fund and as a way to bail out um, a city that was heading to just financial, financial ruin instead of what its purpose was, to help the neighborhoods. And people were finally able to get some victories on that and the victories laid the groundwork for the development corporations. There's one characteristic of the groups that must be mentioned. In spite of the occasional flights of machismo by male organizers, this was very much a women's movement. It was led by people like Inez Killingsworth, Sarah Turner, Barbara Pertz, Gloria Aaron, and many, many others. I can say, based on my experience with this book, along with the one that I'm currently researching on small grassroots environmental groups, that activism in America and probably everywhere else is inconceivable without the participation of and leadership of women. No establishment is safe as long as there are women gathered around kitchen or dining room tables discussing grievances with that establishment. There were major successes. The neighborhoods began to be taken seriously. Issues and concerns began to be addressed. The victories won by organizers opened the door to the rise of development corporations that are so prominent today. Barriers were broken down between races in one of the most segregated cities in the country. The leaders of the city realized they could no longer ignore the residents of the city and simply rule from on high. Most important of all, 
is that the groups began to set the agenda for neighborhood issues in Cleveland instead of just being the pawns of the powerful. I think that the greatest accomplishment of the movement was how it led to the personal and professional development of the organizers, the leaders, and the rank and file of the groups. I call the movement one of the greatest successes in mass civic education in Cleveland's history. Ordinary, everyday Clevelanders whose lives had been limited to work and home, who in many cases did not, not have much education, learned complicated government regulations and went up against representatives of the elite toe-to-toe -to -toe in negotiations. They got to travel to other cities and meet their peers within the network of National People's Action. They learned how to chair meetings, make up agendas, and develop strategies to deal with their neighborhood's problems. They learned public speaking, and, and it made their lives interesting. Best of all, they lost their fear of those who were above them in the social pecking order of American society. I always say that activism is good for you, and it was very good for the veterans of this movement. But it was all over with within a decade of its beginning. Some groups lingered on until the end of the 1980s, but just a few, and many of the groups that lingered on and kept their names, they only kept their names and everything else changed for them as far as the work they were able to do. So what killed this movement? Number one, the triumph of Reaganism. The election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 was the great victory of a conservative movement that had been gathering steam since the candidacy of Barry Goldwater in 1964. It changed America's values, culture, and politics, all in ways that were hostile to the community organizations of Cleveland. On college campuses, working for systemic change was out, and MBAs were in. The supply of idealistic students coming off college campuses that provided the labor pool of organizers for the groups dried up. The impact on programs and funding from the federal government was immediate. Ken Esposito was an organizer working on a program out of FEMA. The day Reagan took office, he was notified that funding was cut off and the program closed. When Esposito asked why, the answer was blunt. Because we are in power now and you are out. One vital program that helped pay organizers for organizing groups was the VISTA program. Volunteers in Service to America, also known as the Domestic Peace Corps. Today it is called AmeriCorps, but it has little to nothing in common with its ancestor. In the 1970s, I was in VISTA doing welfare rights organizing in Dayton, Ohio. In the 1960s, my wife was in VISTA in Phoenix working against the tracking of Hispanic students in the schools. VISTA became AmeriCorps after Reagan, and has never returned to its organizing roots. Two, the commission steps back. Bishop James Hickey became James Cardinal Hickey in 1980 and moved to Washington, D.C. The Catholic Commission lost its greatest champion and so did the community organizations of Cleveland. The church in general was making a conservative turn that it would remain on until the papacy of Francis. Bishop Anthony Pillow replaced Hickey. He was not a conservative, but neither was he an advocate of the type of activities that Hickey gave cover to. What was unusual was that he was from the Diocese of Cleveland when the traditional practice of the church was to bring in new bishops from outside a diocese. He had deep ties to the community, Cleveland community from the parish level to the movers and shakers of Cleveland. He did not sympathize with those in the neighborhoods who considered those movers and shakers to be public enemies. He mandated that organizing activities be run out of the parishes, not the independent community organizations. The chill was on. Auxiliary Bishop William Cosgrove left in 1976 to take a position in Belleville, Illinois. Finally, Harry Fagan left. In 19... In Finally, Harry Fagan left. The ultimate salesman schmoozer and the public face of the commission 
took a similar position in New York City in 1983. The loss of Hickey, Cosgrove, and Fagan orphaned the community organizations of Cleveland. And blowback. Since their founding in the mid 1970s, the community organizations of Cleveland had been on a roll. They had forced powerful banks and corporations to come to the negotiating table. They routinely humbled recalcitrant bureaucrats to address the needs of the neighborhoods and improve the delivery of services. Council people whose previous attitude towards the groups was kill it before and multiply multiplies, now wanted to be their friends. Then they launched a campaign against the wrong opponent and had a head-on collision with reality. With the arrival of the Reagan administration, the natural gas industry saw within reach one of its fondest dreams, the deregulation of natural gas. One of the biggest holders of natural gas fields that would profit greatly from deregulation was the Sohio Corporation. Uh, now that's BP. <clears throat> the uh, Sohio Corporation, which occupied the top, occupied a top position in the hierarchy of Cleveland corporations and of the wealthy and rich in the Cleveland area. It was so wealthy that it built its headquarters on Public Square and paid for it with cash. As part of a national campaign against deregulation led by NPA, the group started a campaign demanding that Ohio create a billion dollar fund to fund weatherization and other energy programs for the Cleveland area. The campaign was typically over the top and featured the shutdown of the 1982 Ohio stockholders meeting, which I was at. The ultimate action, I almost brought a little whistle that we blow, blew down in Renaissance Hotel that disrupted things, but I decided not to. The ultimate action was in September of 1982 when the groups visited the Chagrin Valley Hunt Club and disrupted a lunch and equestrian event in search of Ohio's chair, Elton Whitehouse. In the words of one leader of Near West Neighbors in Action, they violated one of the cardinal rules in American society. They embarrassed the rich in front of the rich. The action scandalized respectable opinion in Cleveland and triggered the defunding of organizing groups, a defunding that largely continues to this day. The groups were too dependent on foundation funding, too dependent on Harry Fagan, and at the same time the development corporations that they had created were available so that the foundations and corporations like Ohio could continue to show their concern for Cleveland's neighborhoods without being chased around town by angry protesters. One by one, the lights went out on community organizing in Cleveland, and they have never come back on since. Aging out of organizing. The organizer in Cleveland during this period was an exciting occupation for a young idealist. You were not just studying about social problems and issues in a college class or seminar. You were dealing with them face to face on the streets of Cleveland. The work was interesting and often fun. There was a culture of solidarity that cemented relationships that continue to this day. The downside was miserable pay and a grueling work ethic of self-sacrifice for the cause. As organizers moved through their 20s, they wanted to leave life on the streets and be able to start families and find jobs where the hours and pay were conducive to normal life. They could find those needs met while using what they learned from organizing by working for the development corporations that had been founded to consolidate the victories they had won as organizers. Those who made the transition are now the development establishment of Cleveland. Five, drying up of volunteers and leaders. The deindustrialization of Cleveland in the 1970s and 80s is a familiar story to Cleveland historians. It also played a very important role in undercutting organizing. When working class families in Cleveland could be supported by one paycheck from a father working in the industry, the wives of these families had the time to volunteer for committees of local community organizations. They could serve on the boards of groups. 
they could come down to the office to help do a mailing. With the loss of that good paying industrial job, everyone in the family had to work to maintain their standard of living, in particular the wives. The development came on top of the de decline in the number of retired and older uh, women and men who were essential volunteers for the groups. This one-two punch depopulated the base of the groups in Cleveland as far as active volunteers. We should not forget as well that burnout was common among organizers, leaders, and volunteers. Compounding all these problems was the increase in poverty in Cleveland. Poor people's lives were so unstable and so besieged by the raw demands of survival that they are a classically hard part of the population to organize. Notes for the next time. There have been many attempts since the 1980s to restore organizing to what it was in its glory days, and all have failed. Now, I'm going to get into a lot of trouble with many of my friends who are out there doing good work for saying this, but the criteria I use to define failure is whether or not the organizing alters the public agenda, and I feel pretty safe in saying that has not happened in over 30 years. Now, one exception to that was during the mortgage meltdown with the ESOP, East Side Organizing Project. They did an exemplary job of organizing. However, ESOP right now has gone totally development corporation, totally corporate, and fired all their organizing staff. They have failed because there isn't today the same institutional support and cover that there was when organizing began in the 1970s. They have failed because what commenced in the 1980s was a very successful counterinsurgency campaign run by the movers and shakers of Cleveland to ensure that development is the only agenda in Cleveland, not systemic change, not grassroots democracy, and certainly not the empowerment of Cleveland's rank and file residents. The entire culture of nonprofit neighborhood groups has changed dramatically. When I first started working for such groups, we called ourselves a movement. Now the groups call themselves an industry. There is a vast, the very language, there is a vast difference between the two. The very language of the nonprofits has changed with the corporatization of their speech and a desire to mimic corporate values and forms of organization. I'm going to finish in describing some of the problems and issues that come to us from this period of organizing, and that's and that still challenged those who would launch a new era of organizing in Cleveland. I've tried to avoid being like Marco Rubio here. <laughs> the problem of funding. The public sector has taxes. The private sector has profits. The nonprofit sector has a baking cup. How do you fund organizing? Who controls organizing? Who do organizers work for? For all nonprofits, foundation funding is essential to keeping the office open, but they are not masters of their own house. There, there are the priorities of the nonprofits, and there are the priorities of the funders, and it doesn't take many smarts to figure out which set of priorities rule. Most directors are not only leaders of their organizations, they are drudges chained to their laptops and computers pounding out proposals. Or as Spencer Wells, who was a, a very famous uh, director of Cleveland Tenants Organization, once explained to his wife, what do I do for a living? I spend my life writing proposals. It is one reason why, though, through a long nonprofit career, I was never seriously interested in being a director and rejected all offers to apply for that sad occupation. There are other problems. I interviewed one former organizer for a West Virginia environmental group who described one funder who required such an onerous routine of reports that the staff wondered if the funding they received was worth the work they had to do, reporting to the foundation. Many of the nonprofits aspire to as diverse a funding base as possible, mixing foundation grants from a number of foundations with a heavy emphasis on dues from members 
and a never-ending series of assorted fundraising events. Many foundations have the attention span of a three-year-old and are constantly changing their focus to fit the issue of the day. I'm glad I'm retired. I'll never, I'll, I'll, I'll never, I'll never work for another nonprofit after this. It's a what beautiful freedom of being retired. Um, in interviewing, in the interviewing I've done for my next book, I have encountered numerous small activist groups who have said thanks but no thanks to the option of going for their 501c3 because they value their independence and freedom of action. It would be interesting to do a study of their effectiveness on issues versus that of your standard 501c3 nonprofit groups. The issue of funding is part of the overall issue of the power of wealth in our society. It would be much easier to support organizing if there was a more vigorous safety net where young people who wanted to enter the field were not burdened by college debt, if sponsoring nonprofits did not have the burden of providing health care, and if encouraging democratic life and organization was looked upon as a compelling public interest to be supported by the public sector instead of just a uh, sort of passive thing, yeah, you've got rights. It would be much easier to advocate for issues if you knew that political leaders you were appealing to were not on the payroll of the various interests you are fighting. The current questions of the distribution of wealth in our society is not just about dollars and cents. It is how much space there is for democracy in our society. Two, the necessity of politics. The groups I wrote about talked endlessly about organizing for power. At the same time, because of the demands of a 501c3 internal revenue status, they were required to practice political chastity. Many groups go for 501c3, c4 status that gives them more political freedom. Talking about power without talk politics is utter nonsense. You are either at the table or you are on the menu. The interface between organizing and politics is a Rubik's Cube that activists are still trying to solve. There are examples of organizing linked to politics. One notable example is the story that has transpired in Richmond, California over the last decade where a community coalition has fought a Chevron refinery to a standstill over its pollution of Richmond while taking control of the local city council in an election that Chevron attempted to buy with its deep pockets and a hand-picked slave of candidates. We need to study such cases to, if, if we are to wish to find a way forward and really organize for power. Three, development is not democracy. The emphasis in Cleveland since the demise of, the organize, of organizing has been a single-minded obsession on development. The market god dictates our values and priorities. The public in Cleveland and all of Cuyahoga County has been routinely extorted into supporting one mega development project after another. Voters are told that the future of civilized life in Cleveland and the prosperity of the county are dependent on this stadium or that convention hall, or that home hotel complex. Meanwhile, the condition of the society outside of downtown or the latest trendy neighborhood is as desperate as ever, and people legitimately wonder where all these wonderful times are that, they were, prom that were promised to them by the backers of the latest bond issue or tax increase to fund the latest big-scale development. The role of the public in all this is to rubber stamp development proposals and to be a cheering section for the movers and shakers, the technocratic whiz kids of economic development, and the latest class of heroic entrepreneurs. Other than rubber stamping these proposals, the public is not to interfere in the work of those who are far smarter and far better connected. It is not to ask questions about who benefits and who pays for development, and it most certainly is not to demand development decisions that are democratically decided on from the bottom up. For instance, one project that we did when I was at Near West Housing Corporation was called the Miller Building. And the Miller Building, yeah, cheering section over there, was very democratically planned. It was a lot of meetings of people, a lot of 
ownership from the community and all. It wasn't just top down. One classic book on community organizing was entitled Let the People Decide. The current philosophy is let the developers decide. The people would not be in a position to decide even if asked because they no longer have organizations that have schooled them in democratic life and decision making or provided access to expertise they would need for negotiations with powerful interests. Uh, my final thing is called for the pulse of democracy. It is an open question given the current political, social, and economic realities if organizing as we experienced it in the 1970s and 80s is viable today. Never in our nation's history has the power of money been so pervasive, so powerful, and so arrogant. Much of that money has funded the dominant political party, which is an agenda of undoing practically every reform this country has seen since the Civil War. The public sector has been emasculated or hijacked. The labor movement has been crushed. We have returned to the good old days of bought and paid for politicians, a working population stripped of most of its rights on the job, breathtaking environmental destruction, and a government that does not even pretend to care about the common good as we have seen in the scandal in Flint, Michigan. But be of good cheer. There certainly will be organizing and activism in the future. The democratic desire and the rebellious itch are still alive and well. Oligarchic rule may look unassailable from below, but the elite have always slept with a nightlight for good reasons. They are acutely aware of their vulnerabilities. That is why there is no limit to the power they seek. The passion for justice remains. We see a new pope in the Vatican who has inspired millions, just as Pope John XXIII did, who launched Vatican II and inspired so many people in Cleveland. My Catholic activist friends have been positively giddy since the installation of Francis. One of the greatest recent democratic victories we have seen in Cleveland history was the resistance to the closing of parishes in the Catholic diocese. Bishop Lennon was a specialist in paring down the parishes in the Boston area. He met his match in Cleveland. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble with the sponsors from Jan Carroll for this. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Critics of Occupy Wall Street dismiss it as a flash in the pan. Though that flash in the pan, however, made the distribution of wealth and power in our society an issue that has produced an election season that has stunned the pundits and upended established calculations of political logic. The KXL pipeline was looked upon as a done deal. After all, whatever big energy wants, big energy gets. But not in this case, as a successful organizing campaign was launched using every tool in the book, from lobbying to civil disobedience, to convince Obama to veto the pipeline last year. <clears throat> Black Lives Matter has put racism, mass incarceration, and police impunity on the agenda, even if we have not yet been able to get justice for Tamir Rice and his family. I think we're going to have to start a conversation on how to totally rethink and rework organizing and activism. If the House of Organizing and Activism, if there was a House of Organizing and Activism, I think we've got to take it right down to the studs and start all over again. We're going to have to see what from the past is still useful and we needs to be discarded. It will be hard work, but I know we can do it because we know activism is the pulse of democracy and we know how vital it is for our future. Organizing in Cleveland may be down right now, but tomorrow is another day. Thank you. And we'll have some questions and answers right now. And my fellow veterans of, of Near West Neighbors in Action are going to take me apart now. <laughs> Can you give a little context in terms of other cities?
during the period that you were talking about what other cities had similar movements and may have been more successful than Cleveland? Um, well, of course, Chicago, Baltimore, um, various other ones. I really haven't studied what exactly happened to them. Uh, if somebody else knows, you know, pipe up, please. But I was too busy kind of like doing this right now to concentrate on it. I know NPA still exists, and I'll get some caught in Shell Trap or Dead now. And uh, NPA is going to be uh, uh, merging with other, other groups, and it's just going to be called People's Action. I know they're still doing all kinds of outrageous stuff, coming into... Uh, Representatives' offices and getting arrested and stuff like that. So, the old, the old uh, vigor is still there. Yeah. Gloria. Well, well, first of all, at that time, I think almost every city and every state had people uh, that were part of NPA, and we would all get together once a year for three days, go to Washington, have planned meetings with legislators or actions. But people from all different areas, like I was involved in community development, I would go and I would meet with people from other states and we would put together a plan. Uh, and then from that we would all be under the same thing. But Randy, <laughs> I think there still is things going on. And you're an uh, open book. What about the incinerator? I went to meetings because I got a call saying, Gloria, you need to come to this meeting. <laughs> I told you, I told you this would happen. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. I told you. Thank I was you, Gloria. This, this is a compliment. This yeah, is a, you know, Jim, Eileen, and Gloria were all going like that. So, you know, so that kind of thing, the same process is still happening. There are small things, small and big things happening. Metro Hospital is still there because people in the community have come together and we won't let them become anything but a public hospital. At one point they wanted to shut down the pharmacy. Within three days from experience, we had it organized, passing out flyers, met with the board, did all kinds of things, and Metro still has an outpatient uh, pharmacy. Many of us are working together in healthcare. Medicaid expansion happened in Ohio because Clevelanders and Columbus and Athens all came together and just kept pounding at our legislator and our governor. The legislator wouldn't do the work, but the governor made sure we have it. And right now we're organizing a round of the Medicaid expansion again and the possibility that there may be a waiver. And if anyone is interested in working on health care, they should call of our, <laughs> our office at 631-2606. Uh, it's, uh, or is it 651? I'm not sure, one of the two. But it's, it's uh, organized. Call Gloria. Or call me at home, 631-6581, <laughs> and I will tell you how you can get involved and various organizing that is still going. And I know and you're not going to remember that, so I, I distributed a yellow copy that's got my email, so, <laughs> and I know how to get a hold of it. And when there's a, 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 a serious issue, especially around the environment, you know you're going to get a call from Randy Cunningham. So <laughs> Randy, you're, you know, you're still very much a leader now in organizing. I'm, I'm just a grunt. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, thing, the thing is that what I'm talking about as far as a demise of organizing, as far as being ongoing groups that are organized on a geographic scale uh, and that continue to work year in, year out. And I'll, there's a lot of this uh, pop-up organizing that, that we, we do. And, and I, I talked in my, put in my talk about what I call uh, lineages of organizing and lineages of activism. Activism, past activism is almost like a compost pile that, that, that helps, uh, helps your, your garden grow, okay? And the thing is that uh, she mentioned one of the, Gloria mentioned one of our, our fights and it was uh, a uh, incinerator 
for gar garbage for Cleveland, and it was like five minute walk from my house on Ridge Road. And we put out the call in opposition to it, and we had a lot of people like Gloria and other people, you know, all the way. We had as diverse a group as a few Tea Partiers and some uh, Occupy Wall Street people going like this, you know. And, um, and we were able to beat them. We were able to beat them. One group in Southwest Cleveland had started organizing against pollution from the flats in 1945. And they have continued to, to maintain their contact list and everything. And they were there. They were there. So I'm talking about a particular type of organizing, which is the, the uh, but, but uh, uh, no, I, I agree with Gloria. A lot of activism is, 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 is continuing. But I still think that the activism needs to be hauled into the garage, put up on a lift, and had some work done on it. I think and, that the... And we, the community, have to take it back. We have to take back the CDCs who have sold their souls and have forgotten why they were there. Community development corporations were put there to do housing for low-income people. They've forgotten that and have sold out for big salaries and for development. And I'm, I'm, we may be in a Catholic church, but they, they've all sold out to screw the community. Well, you know, one of the big things I thought, though, with all this um, talk about Tamir Rice and all, when the decision finally came down from the grand jury, there were only about 200 people out in front of the Justice Center protesting that. And that speaks volumes about the passivity that you find in so many of our communities and all. And I was just flabbergasted with it. And, and one of the more flamboyant activists in Cleveland, Art McCoy, was beside himself about it. So that's why I'd say that there needs to be a lot, lot more work to be done and all. But um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of activism. That's why I've said that I'm about ready to go back to work so I can relax. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think is going to happen this summer in July at the RNC? Mm. We're planning some things. Outside no. agitators. <laughs> Inside agitators. Yeah. No, uh, there are several, there's one group that's been organized by, uh, by Organized Ohio by Larry Bresler, who many of us know, who has put together a coalition of people to um, have a demonstration on, um, on the issue of poverty. And there's a, uh, going to be a convention, a gathering, a conference the weekend before. We're dealing with march routes and stuff like that. Of course, Office of Homeland Security will take over the city, you know, and who knows what what's going to happen, but there is, there are some, um, some, uh, uh, there is organizing going on. Fantastic presentation. An amazing amount of research and the narrative you packed together. A hundred um, people, 12 years. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering, as you said, there has to be a whole, you know, uh, look back at everything that happened if, if people are going to go forward. It seems to me always, I mean, I think maybe you're making this point, but that there was inherent contradiction in the movement and that all the funding and the cover, as you said, came from the very people that the movement was training to attack on a regular basis. I mean, it seemed almost unsustainable from moment one, other than the cover of the Catholic Church. And once that, you see, I think you made this point, but... Is well, well one, one problem is that so much of the funding came from the Gun Foundation. <laughs> and uh, so much funding was arranged by Harry Fagan, who was kind of like the sugar daddy of, of a lot of this stuff. 
And I know Bill Callahan, who's known by many people here, has always said that, that, that Harry was too generous and all. So there's a problem, though. Liberal foundations live under this assumption that you're going to go and be funded by them for, say, three to five years or something. And then you're going to be independent, financially independent, as if you're a muffler shop. Um, conservative foundations, such as the Mallinckrodt Foundations and, and the Heinz Foundation and all these other ones, once they start funding you, they fund you long term. As I term it, liberal foundations do one night stands and conservative foundations marry you. <laughs> you know, and uh, so, uh, that's, so that's a problem. But, uh, and they're very fickle. They're very fickle. One, you know, just, just uh, for instance, they were uh, for, for a lo long time ignoring fracking until fracking got to be a big movement. And then they started, uh, the foundations and larger organizing groups got involved in fracking. For years, ignored, ignored the issue of climate change. All of a sudden, climate change is the issue du jour, which I am very happy about because I'm very concerned about it. And I was up to my ears in uh, the KXL pipeline or but uh, so poor directors are sitting there going, well, where do I go next? You know, what do I do now? You know, and the attitude of the foundations in Cleveland has not only been hostile to activism. Uh, my uh, former boss, uh, Mike Pepsi, said that they were even hostile to advocacy. You know, and so. And so that is, that's a, so the issue of funding and, and just how we think about organizing and stuff like that, there is a reason why so many groups such as uh, Occupy and things like that go very low, low, low level organization, operate almost as, as just almost clandestine organizations and just pop up and do, do actions and stuff like that and then fade away because they've, they've, they've been unable to, to sustain things. Can I ask a, to jump totally to the, few, to the now as a follow-up question? Do you, do, you, do you have any take on greater Cleveland congregations? You, you mentioned Saul Alinsky at the beginning, and it, it seems you to know, me I really in don't, many ways they're as close to his original vision, and they're succeeding at it as many of the neighborhood groups were. On different issues in a different way, but... I don't hear about it. They had a thousand people out Monday night and they had both of the Democratic candidates in front of them agreeing to answer their demands 15 days from now. They need good, the they, they need good PR people. They were on the yeah. front page of the front page. Yeah. They're on the front page in, in the front page of the Jewish News and the, they're, I, <laughs> I was too busy preparing for this. Jewish I was too busy preparing for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would, I, Randy, it's Mark Davidson. I don't know yeah, I know, yeah. How you doing? I mean, I, I'm just intrigued by what they're doing. I've, I've participated a little bit, my wife more. And Rob Kleidman from CSU is very involved in that type of organizing and all. And um, I just know what's going on. You know, that's all. You know, I, I have my fingers in enough pies as it is right now. No, no, I just think, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.